This lecture series is co-sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Judiciary Politics and Media, or IJPM, uh, which I keep by the direct, and the Carnegie Legal Reporting Program uh, at Newhouse, that I keep by. That ends the fellow right there. Oh, I got him. The Law, Politics, and Media Lecture Series is associated with a PCAL course uh, based at College of Law that enrolls students from Newhouse, uh, from the School of Maxwell Public Policy School. And the aim of the lecture series and the course is to expose students and the large university community to a range of speakers who explore issues at the intersection of law, politics, and media uh, as integrated subjects of analysis. Today we are fortunate enough to be joined by uh, Robert Beckjian, who is the uh, Administrator and Counsel for the New York State Commission on uh, Judicial Conduct. Uh, Mr. Confection is also a graduate of uh, Syracuse University, uh, class of 72. Roy tells me that, uh, that Bob was uh, editor of the Daily Orange uh, when he was here during his multiple time uh, on campus. Uh, so he is actually began as a journalist. Uh, he uh, went on to uh, get his JD at Fordham Law School. Uh, he also uh, was educated at uh, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government which is almost as good as coming back to math. <laughs> we like to think of that all the uh, In addition to being an administrator counsel at the Commission on Judicial Conduct, uh, he has served on the advisory committee to the American Bar Association's Commission to Evaluate Model Code of Judicial Disciplinary Counsel. Uh, he has served a variety of distinguished uh, service positions. He's a member of the editorial board at Justice System Journal. Uh, today, uh, his lecture is entitled, Why Judges Go Bad and How the Media Can Help Keep Them Honest. Uh, he is going to speak to us this afternoon, and then uh, we'll have a period for a question and answer. And as is our usual practice, uh, there will be a reception afterwards at 5 o'clock, uh, right out in the entryway to, to this room. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Benetton. very much. Thank you all. Uh, greetings from the dysfunction of your state capital in Albany. Uh, although I do come from New York City, uh, I do spend a fair amount of my time in, in, in Albany and it is, uh, as you are reading on a daily basis, one of the most uh, bizarre planets uh, in our solar system. Uh, and hopefully <coughs> before the day is over you'll at least have some sense that at least some parts of the New York State government are focused and acting uh, uh, professionally and in a manner that brings credit to the state. And if you don't mind, uh, I certainly wouldn't. If you have questions before we get to the question period, uh, raise your hand and, and we, can, uh, we can do Q&A as we're discussing various topics along the way. One of the uh, highlights of my career was as a journalist, which ended with the Daily Orange. Uh, and it's always <laughs> a pleasure for me to come back to the uh, campus here. And if you've been around as long as I have, you actually get the opportunity to deliver a lecture which is attended by one of your former professors, Ralph Ketchum from the Maxwell School, whom I had as a professor in the late 60s and early 70s is here. I'm very happy uh, to be able, to, finally, to turn the tables on Professor Ketchum. Um, all 50 states have some form of judicial disciplinary mechanism. Typically, it's a state commission which is responsible for receiving complaints and investigating allegations of ethical misconduct against judges and, where appropriate, disciplining them <coughs> for violating those rules. Virtually all the states have promulgated ethical standards that are based upon the American Bar Association's model code of judicial conduct. Uh, the ABA uh, website actually has that code and a variety of other useful documents that you might uh, take a chance to look at. Now, in New York, the code has been uh, adopted into a document that's called the Rules Governing Judicial Conduct and it is those rules which my office and its counterparts around the country enforce. <clears throat> Who are the people that make up the judiciary and 
that my agency uh, oversees in terms of ethics enforcement. Well, there are 3,500 judges throughout the New York State Unified Court System. Judges from every level, from local part-time town and village court justices in places like Camillus and Manlius, uh, to city court judges, county court, state supreme court, family court. Uh, there is a patchwork system of courts that make up the unified court system in New York, into and including the appellate courts and the New York State Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in our state. I mean, most other states have that would have been called the Supreme Court. And out of those 3,500 judges, uh, 2,300 of them serve in part-time county village courts, where typically, if you have any experience with the court system, it will be in sending a speeding ticket that you might have gotten to one of those courts, because whoever the trooper or officer was in writing out that ticket would make it returnable in the geographic area closest to the throughway point at which you were stopped, for example. Now, how many of you would think that in order to become a judge in New York State, uh, you would need to be a lawyer? Well, you can raise your hands, that's okay. <laughs> there, 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 there's no right or wrong answer to this, because, <laughs> because the answer is both. Um, to serve on a court, higher, city court or higher, you must be a lawyer. But the majority of judges in New York serve in the town and village courts, and they are not attorneys. They don't have to be attorneys. And out of the 2,300 or so that occupy those positions, typically two to a town, only about 400 of them have law degrees. The only other requirements are that they be residents, that they be over 18, and that they uh, be elected to the post. And most of them have positions other than their judgeships, because those part-time courts typically will meet once or twice a week, perhaps an evening session, one or two daytime sessions, and most of the individuals that populate those courts actually have other jobs. You said um, 400 have JDs out of how many? Out of 2,300. 20 Which means that uh, out of the 19, uh, uh, there are 1,900 of them who don't have law degrees, which means that the majority of judges in New York State don't have law degrees, which usually comes as a surprise, particularly people in law school. Um, well, what kinds of um, trouble, so to speak, do those, does, does, does the judiciary get, get into? Um, in the more colorfully phrased, uh, title for this lecture, um, How or Why Do Judges Go Bad? Um, and what can the media do to help prevent that? And I'm not sure that there are um, answers to either of those questions. They tend to raise um, philosophical, um, psychological, ethical, issues or questions, and I'm not sure that it's it's the role of the media to solve the problem, and I'm not sure that we can really identify precisely why it is that some judges go bad. I should say, and I'll probably repeat this, um, and if I don't, I should, various times throughout the next hour or so, that even in my experience, whose job it is to identify the wrongdoing and where appropriate to hold the judges accountable for it. Most of the judges uh, in New York State perform their judicial duties responsibly, competently, and ethically. Uh, and to give you some statistical sense of where I come to that conclusion, my office receives about 18 to 1950 complaints per year. We have the authority to investigate those complaints and, where appropriate, to commence formal disciplinary proceedings against uh, judges who, against whom investigation has determined that there is reasonable cause to conclude that a violation of an ethical rule is committed. And a formal disciplinary adjudication will begin. 
every year, notwithstanding those 1,900 or so complaints, we publicly disciplined about 25 judges. And we privately caution or give warnings to about 35 judges. So out of a judiciary with 3,500 judges, about 1% might hear from us at the end of an investigation with a private confidential letter essentially suggesting that the violation of the rule was de minimis, uh, or the judge had corrected it, there was no real harm to a party or to an individual. And less than 1% will actually be publicly disciplined. Good question. Are the people who are being disciplined, are they more likely or less likely to have more It's a good, It's a good question. Uh, it's a little easier for me to answer in terms of the town and village court justices, including lawyers. Um, the part-time judges versus the judges of higher courts. Um, about two-thirds of the judiciary in New York are made up of the part-time town of court justices. And over the years, since 1978, uh, when the commission in its current format was constituted by an amendment to the state constitution, almost exactly two-thirds of our disciplines have involved judges of the town and village courts, which suggests that, in one respect, uh, there is a certain proportionality between the degree to which they occupy a segment of the overall judiciary and the percentage um, by which those judges are disciplined. But looking behind those statistics, only about one-third of the complaints that we receive every year involve the part-time town of village court justices. And roughly one-half of our investigations each year involve justices of the town and village courts, which suggests to me over a 30-some-odd year period that complaints against the town and village court justices are more likely to have merit than complaints against the full-time Judiciary. <clears throat> so, as is almost always the case with statistics, you can find a way to spin them uh, to come out according to your preconceptions. The town and village court uh, judges associations tend to observe the overall rate of discipline as suggesting that things are in relative balance, uh, while those who want to change the system from a part-time town and village court system to a more full-time court system or a district court system, or those that advocate that all judges should be lawyers, tend to look at the overall statistics of incoming complaints and the percentage of those involving town and village court justices that result in discipline are higher than the percentage involving full-time courts. So what kind of trouble do, do judges get into when they do? remembering that it's a relatively small percentage of those in the court system that do. Well, we had a um, public discipline of a judge in Queens, New York, matter of Blackburn, and all of the case citations that I refer to are available on the Commission's website, so you can, at your convenience, check those out. Um, that website is www.scjc state.ny.us and on the home page there is a link to the appeal decision so that the appellate sites for these cases are also uh, there and readily available. Uh, Blackburn was a full-time judge sitting in a uh, court in Queens which was dealing with uh, lower level drug cases. She had a defendant who was appearing before her for a status Visit. There was no particular adjudication to take place that day. In the drug treatment courts, usually the way they work is the defendant pleads guilty and the sentence is deferred pending a rehabilitative stint. And upon successful completion of the program, uh, the sentence will be effectively commuted to time in rehab. Uh, and for nonviolent drug offenders, that has turned out to be 
particularly for the first time, the Fender's a very useful program. So Judge Blackburn was presiding over one of those matters, and a particular defendant was scheduled to appear before her was the subject of an arrest warrant for an unrelated event. And knowing that he was going to be in court, a uh, police detective came to the courthouse to effect the arrest. It's a safe place to make an arrest because everyone's got to go through a magnetometer to get into the courthouse. And where the police know where the defendant's going to be certainly beats uh, opening what you um, can't control what might be behind the door of the house or a workplace or what have you. Well, it turned out that the judge was advised that there was a detective in the hallway waiting to make an arrest, and she was somehow offended and thought that there was some disrespect being shown to the court by the detective coming there to make an arrest of someone who was uh, one of her defendants in the drug treatment court. So she ordered her court officer to escort the defendant out the back door through a private corridor to leave the courthouse specifically for the purpose of, of avoiding the arrest that would have occurred when the session was over and he would have gone out through the doors into the public corridor. And the court officer uh, told the judge he didn't think that was a very good idea. She insisted. He went to the assistant district attorney who was standing up on the cases that day. She spoke to the judge and said, this is not a very good idea. Uh, but the judge was not to be deterred. And she said that if the officer didn't escort the defendant out, she would. And not wanting to jeopardize the judge and not wanting to have uh, a defendant roaming around unescorted in the back corridors of the courthouse, which is for court employees and, and, and other judges. Um, he escorted the guy outside. Meanwhile, the prosecutor went out the main door to the corridor and told the detective what had happened. He couldn't quite believe it. Raced around to the outside of the building, but it was too late. Uh, and it wasn't until another day and a half before they found the defendant, who was not trying to escape the jurisdiction, by the way. He went back to his treatment facility, um, and they made the arrest about 36 hours later. Now, what would you do in a situation like that? I mean, needless to say, that in terms of the role of the media, there was great media attention paid to this episode, which is how my office learned about it, which is how most of the reading public in New York City learned about it. But show of hands, um, or comment, the facts haven't been established at a disciplinary proceeding. Given that the commission can privately caution, publicly reprimand, or remove a judge from office, how many would have privately uh, cautioned the judge for that comment? <coughs> well, we've got about five or six hands. Um, how many would have publicly reprimanded the judge for that comment? Quite a few more. Uh, how many would have removed that judge from office? <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, there was some discussion about whether she had obstructed justice or or uh, had interfered with uh, governmental administration by having helped a defendant uh, avoid an arrest. Uh, I argued that she should be removed from office. And uh, the commission, in a divided vote, uh, agreed. The commission, by the way, is an 11-member board of directors that uh, meets part-time. It, it, it has judges, lawyers, and, and two uh, lay members on it. Uh, it's created by the state constitution. Uh, and they are the ones who actually come and vote on the dispositions in these cases. My staff and I make the presentations, we do the investigations, um, and then at the disciplinary proceeding, which is held in front of an impartial referee designated by the commission to try these cases, we will present our cases, the judge and judge's counsel will, will defend, um, the referee will submit a report, and then both sides will argue the merits of that report in briefs and in an oral argument. So the commission agreed that uh, by a divided vote that this was egregious 
misbehavior and it should result in removal from office. And the judge appealed, which the judge in New York has a right to do, directly to the state's highest court. And the Court of Appeals upheld the removal, um, finding that this uh, behavior was so out of the role of the neutral arbiter. The judge is not there to effect an arrest, nor is the judge there to thwart an arrest. The judge is there to deal with the merits of the cases that are presented before him or her in an impartial uh, fashion, without regard to, um, without playing any role in, in the creation of the manufacture of these cases. And, and uh, although the judge was not subsequently charged with interfering with governmental administration or the obstruction of justice, it was our view, uh, which, which the Court of Appeals upheld, that this was such a, an extreme and egregious interference with the proper role of law enforcement that it required the judge to be removed from office, particularly using court personnel to help a, uh, a defendant, in a sense, become a fugitive uh, from, from the law. The very kind of thing that judges sign warrants to prevent uh, was what this particular judge committed. Now, this was a, an odd and one-time only event, but it was deemed to be so extreme that removal from office was was warranted. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, particularly among the New York tabloids, there was an enormous field day to be had with this case. And unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of, of, of um, additional commentary about the judge and her prior service as a commissioner of a New York City uh, agency because of um, non-punishable but uh, publicly delicious behavior she had engaged in some years earlier, having redecorated her office at um, great public expense with a pink leather couch and a variety of other uh, things that cost an enormous amount of money and that ultimately um, was revisited when, when this new episode on the bench had occurred. And one of the things that we had to do was to separate the, the uh, media hype from the facts and an application of the rules on judicial conduct, which effectively um, required that a judge has to be and appear impartial, respect and comply with the law, maintain professional competence in the law, and otherwise behave in a way that, that upholds public confidence in the integrity and the independence and the impartiality of the judiciary. Now, a, a reverse situation, which involved a judge from the city of Syracuse some years ago. Yeah? What was the crime that the, the crime underway? He was charged with a, with a burglary. The underlying crime was in drug treatment court for a low-level uh, drug possession offense. He wasn't, used, he wasn't a seller. Um, uh, the new crime was burglary. The charges, the burglary charges were ultimately uh, a drop against that defendant uh, when the prosecution determined that there wasn't sufficient evidence to go forward. But none of that was known at the time that Judge Blackburn directed the court uniformed officer to take this guy sneaking out the back way. Um, yeah? Uh, what action was taken toward the court officer? You know, you uh, nothing. Nothing. As a matter of fact, given that he was being ordered by the judge who was saying she was going to do it herself, if he didn't, um, it, it, it became a prudent thing for him to escort the person out the back because uh, unescorted defendants are not allowed in the, in the private corridors of the courthouse and uh, a judge would not necessarily be able to provide security if she were the one who were literally walking them out. Now, in the Syracuse case, um, about 15 years earlier, there was a city court judge, Richard Sardino, um, whose brother, in the time that I was an undergraduate here, was the chief of police. 
in Syracuse. Um, Sardino was a city court judge, and he was riding around with police officers in their patrol cars while they were on patrol and making arrests. And he was, he was observing those arrests. Um, and then, when those cases were brought to court, he was presiding over them, at least in the initial stages of arraignment, and lacking the impartiality of a judge who would not have been a witness uh, was something that he and any judge should have recognized. It compromises your impartiality, not only if you see the event, but if you're riding around with, with law enforcement um, while it is collaring defendants and bringing them into the courthouse. Uh, there were some other um, abuses of discretion that, that Sardino was committing in connection with these cases, including not making sure to effectuate the right to counsel um, and setting bail in a, in a punitive form. And um, he, too, was removed from office, and that, too, was upheld by the, by the state's court of appeals. And the principle was the same that the judge was acting in a way either to thwart in the Blackburn case or to uh, enhance or encourage or to lend the imprimatur of, of the impartial office at a very partial event, the arrest of someone for an alleged commission of a crime. And obviously, being in the patrol car and hearing what the cops are saying about the particular defendant were things that would reasonably I think, in, in the mind of any audience, compromise the impartiality of the judge, and certainly the appearance of impartiality. And a, an appearance um, is, is as important a standard as maintaining actual uh, propriety and avoiding impropriety and avoiding impartiality, because for most of the public, um, that's the way we see and evaluate the courts and the judiciary. Another case in which a judge uh, in Niagara Falls was presiding over um, a series of, of status reports on individuals who um, had bail uh, and were, were making appearances in court, basically status appearances. Uh, no particular adjudications were going to take place that day either. There were some 46 uh, defendants who were there to report to the court and um, indicate whether or not they had met their community service or were uh, partially completed and so on and so forth. Uh, in the middle of proceedings, someone's cell phone rang. And the judge was upset, having made an announcement at the beginning of the court that uh, everyone should turn off their cell phones. He does not want cell phones to be ringing in the courtroom. So no one heard precisely where the phone was when no one knew whose phone it was. So what the judge did, um, his name is Restaino, R-E-S-T-A-I-N-O, went to his own website, as is the health site. He asked the first defendant who was in front of him uh, was that your cell phone? Now clearly it couldn't have been because this, everyone agreed that the sound was coming from in the back toward where the spectator section was. So the defendant said no. And the judge asked him if you know who it was, and he said no. Um, and so the judge announced that um, uh, if the person whose cell phone it was didn't fess up to it, he was going to start putting, he was going to start remanding people jail. He's going to basically revoke bail and put these defendants in. And that's before he even knew if the phone was actually in, belonged to a defendant. Could have belonged to a lawyer, could have belonged to a court employee, could have been prosecutors, could have been cops, could have been anybody's. Nobody knew and no one was admitting whose phone it was. And one by one, he went through these defendants. And one by one, they didn't know whose phone it was. And one by one, uh, he revoked their bail status. And uh, some of them were able to um, post 
higher bond. Uh, and some were not. And I think about a dozen were actually taken to jail, where they spent the better part of the day until um, a media outcry uh, put this all over the internet, all over the world, really. I mean, we, 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 my office was getting emails from Europe, Asia, South America, people who had read about this particular episode, and because of the internet, uh, news services, this thing was out there in, in no time flat. Um, and the judge got uh, called by his administrative superiors, and he decided that he would call those 12 uh, defendants who were remanded back um, and release them. His, he had really no excuse or explanation. For, for what he did. He was, you know, he, he, he was under some stress in his home life. Who is it at some point or another? Um, there, was, there, was no, there was no legal justification for, for, for what he did. So, um, show of hands, maybe I'll do a little better this time. Um, how many would privately caution this judge for what he did? Okay, there's one. How many would publicly reprimand the judge for what he did? And assume, by the way, that um, uh, that he was an otherwise unblemished reputation. <clears throat> never been in disciplinary trouble before, never been in ethics trouble before. Okay, how many would remove that judge from the office? Well, he was removed, and the removal wasn't held. Uh, I mean, there was real harm to people here. People who were incarcerated, uh, there was one who had a job interview that afternoon that he couldn't go to. There was one who had to pick up his kid after school, couldn't go to that. Um, no one had come to court that day expecting that there was going to be anything out of the ordinary, and most were not prepared for, for what happened. And it was such a bizarre episode that it, it's almost impossible to plan your, your life against uh, such behavior. And given that the that the harm um, was was so uh, uh, serious, and that this was not a inadvertent or spur of the moment or momentary lapse, it's not that he put all 46 people or revoked their status all at once. He did it one after another after another. Plenty of time to reflect. Plenty of time to think. He took a lunch break. Came back. <laughs> Before he finished with the with the 46, I mean it's a it's it's a it's a very unusual set of circumstances. Um, well, why does that sort of thing happen? Is there something in the nature of being a judge that causes somebody <coughs> to go off the rails like this? Um, and I I mean I can give you. Uh, over 700 examples of, of, of disciplinary decisions, public decisions that we rendered in the last 30 years that, that although not all of them are going to be this bizarre and unusual, uh, would, would, su would surprise you. Uh, the judge who sends anonymous threatening letters um, and faxes to a lawyer uh, with whom he has some sort of personality in the conflict. Um, and forensically, we were able to determine that the messages had come from his email account at a time when he was logged on. Um, and identifying the, the origin of the, of the faxes, but he was denying it all the way through. It's very, very odd, strange, bizarre behavior. Um, not so odd or strange. Uh, but misconduct nevertheless. We've had a number of cases involving judges who have abused the power and prestige of their office in connection with um, a romantic relationship. A judge who fired his law clerk after she broke off uh, an affair that they had been had. When the affair had begun, both um, were married to other people. She got divorced. He didn't. 
she eventually saw that there was no future in this relationship, and when she ended it, he fired. And he left the message in which he was uh, discharging her on her telephone answering machine. <laughs> and took great offense uh, at the fact that she would have kept the message uh, as evidence in, in, in her uh, wrongful termination action. And then, obviously, um, she gave it to the commission, and we investigated and determined that, in fact, although it didn't seem likely when we first heard the story, that this, in fact, had been what happened. And he, he had, I mean, who does that and leaves it on the answering machine? It wasn't, it wasn't a surreptitiously recorded message. It was, oh, I'm not available. Please leave a message after the beep, beep. And there's, you know, well, and he didn't stop there. Over a period of, of a couple of weeks, he left 77 messages on the machine. Some of them were quite um, profane, um, describing in some detail what he expected she must be doing with her new boyfriend and uh, the like. Uh, and he, he was removed, and one wonders sometimes why it is that, that on facts and circumstances so, uh, so open and shut, uh, a, a judge might want to appeal a decision, but he did. He took it up to the, to the state's highest court, which affirmed uh, the removal. And we've had some other cases in which, which did not result in removal, where there was a romantic relationship, um, where in one case, um, oh, by the way, the name of that case was Gelfand, G-E-L-F-A-N-D, if you want to look it up. Uh, two others that um, uh, you might find of interest, Diblasi, D-I-F-O-B-L-A-S-I, -E uh, and Simeone, S-I-M-E-O-N-E. Diblasi and Simeone were, were, were judges who um, were having romantic relationships with, in one case, a lawyer, and in another case, um, the director of a youth services facility that had business before the court. And both of those judges were publicly censured because the relationships had ended, and they had both made some effort uh, to change their assignment or otherwise uh, arrange not to be presiding over cases involving uh, their paramours. But in both of their instances, in both of their cases, they both did actually handle some matters involving their lovers. And of course, they didn't make disclosure of that fact, so the other side wouldn't know uh, to ask for the judge's refusal, which would have been the appropriate thing. I mean, if, if ever you was ever a judge, or a lawyer appearing before a judge with whom you're having a romantic relationship, don't do it. It seems almost silly to have to say it, but the judge should refuse from the case, or the lawyer should, if the judge doesn't, then the lawyer should seek a postponement uh, and go up to an administrative superior and get the, court, the case transferred to someone else. You know, I don't think there's any horn book that mentions that, um, what should be basic fundamental judicial behavior, but it happens. Why does this sort of thing happen? Why do, no one goes on the bench, no one becomes a lawyer, no one becomes a judge, in order to break the rule, in order to act unethical. You all go into this profession uh, with some sense of, I hope, idealism, with some sense of doing uh, public good, of representing people in an adversary system for the betterment, ultimately, of, of, of our society. We don't go into the law, certainly don't become judges, uh, in, order, in order to act unethically or disrespectfully or um, use, use, the, use the bench or the power of the law inappropriately. But it happens. And why does And it's not just limited to New York, and it's not limited to uh, judges who are elected as opposed to those who are appointed. It's not limited to the lawyer versus a non-lawyer judge. The kinds of behavior that I see in my professional uh, life cut across a very wide swath. So why does it happen? What is it about the judiciary or about being a judge? 
Um, for those of you who, 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 who are in my generation or thereabouts, you might remember the original Bedazzle with uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, in which Peter Cook plays the devil and Dudley Moore is trying to earn the affections and attentions of a, of, a, of a woman who's not paying any money. And so he makes the deal with the devil. And at one point in the movie, he asks why it was that the devil left heaven. Why, why, how, and why did he become a fallen angel? And Peter Cook sits up on a fire hydrant and he says, I want you to just sort of circle around me and praise me. Say wonderful things about me. So Dr. Moore starts walking around. Oh, you're wonderful, you're marvelous, you're all seeing, you're all knowing, you're, you're, you're magnificent, you're beneficent. And then he says, I'm getting tired of this. Can't we change places? At which point Peter Cook says, my point exactly. Imagine now doing this for all of eternity. Well, what is a judge? A judge is a person who, when he walks into the room, we all stand up. And when she sits down, we all sit down. They're sitting up here. The lawyers and the litigants are down here. They wear robes. They have, we call them your honor, whether they're on the bench or not. Meet them at our association. They're not Bill or Joe. Yeah. Your Honor. They're not Fred or Nick, Mary. <coughs> it takes a lot of effort after weeks and months and years of being treated that way not to assume a certain arrogance of power, not to assume the sense that you are all powerful, uh, which in the way our legal system is obviously organized, judges do wield an enormous amount of power. And it takes an awful lot of, of emotional and psychological restraint not to get carried away with that power and authority. And so the judge who sends anonymous threatening letters to a lawyer that he doesn't like has been affected or infected by the arrogance of power, and never does it thinking that he's going to get caught. And the judge who directs a court officer to do her bidding in helping a defendant escape arrest doesn't even realize that what she's doing, look, this is my courtroom, I am a queen of this domain, these people work for me, they'll do what I tell them, I take offense, that someone's coming in here taking one of my defendants to jail for something that has nothing to do with what's before me, but it doesn't matter, it's one of my defendants, it's my proceeding, it's my courtroom, doesn't think, even when it's pointed out to her by two other people in the courtroom, this is not a good idea, that she can get in trouble for it, or that it's wrong. Um, there's a certain break that gets released and you will all find it yourselves when you, when, 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 you, when you start to practice. And those of you that have had the opportunity to appear in a court already have probably seen it. You get one thought when you're facing the bench. Um, when the judge says X, you don't say Y. You might say, may it please the court, might the court reconsider. There is a, it's, there's an off with their heads kind of fear that takes over the, the legal profession when they are appearing before um, the, the very powerful judges that, that, that rule them. The judge that starts an affair with an employee, well, okay, we see, that in, we see that in all business models. But how often are you going to find um, that that extends to the advocates appearing before the judge and that the judge doesn't feel anything wrong, at least not initially, with, I can be fair, so what that it's my girlfriend? I can be fair. The other side doesn't need to know that she and I are sleeping together. Well, I think the other side might want to. But even if they didn't, what is it about the way we treat judges that, that takes this sort of natural check and balance away? Um, and I'm not sure that, the, that we can answer that question without, without deeply delving into uh, the, the psychology 
and the sociology and the philosophy that informs um, human behavior. I just don't know. I just don't know. But if any one of us were being treated like a king or a queen or a god, day in and day out, um, we would probably lose touch with that common characteristic that we had before we went on to the bench. So that's, I think that's one, one view of why it is that, that, these, that these kinds of things happen. Um, there, are other, there are other reasons why it happens. I mean, judges, like any, any walk of life, are going to, uh, are going to um, be, be comprised of, of, of individuals, some of whom are going to uh, be interested in making money no matter what the means. Perhaps you've been reading about these two judges uh, in uh, Pennsylvania who were taking bribes or kickbacks from juvenile justice facilities to which they were remanding juveniles, often without hearings, often for the uh, uh, for offenses or violations that should not in any rational system have been in someone's incarceration. There'll be some who do it because they can. Again, I have to say that in my experience, most of the judges that um, I've come across, not in terms of being the subjects of complaints that we investigate, but in my travels throughout the court system, make an effort not to be sucked in by the um, seductive power of power itself and of being constantly deferred to by people that come into their work. Yes? Um, we've talked, so, the people in this class, we've talked a lot about the judicial selection process. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, you know, about what's the right way to select judges should they be elected or how should they be selected? Do you think there's anything wrong with the way the judicial selection process is that contributes to this, or I mean, I know you said the vast majority of judges are pretty honest, but are there any changes? Um, most of the judges in New York are elected. There are only a, there's only a handful. The state's highest court um, is populated by candidates who are nominated by a nominations commission, and they are confirmed by the state senate. Uh, the governor can appoint intermediate level appellate judges to the appellate division. Virtually all other judges in New York State, uh, with one or two minor exceptions, um, are elected. There's a court of claims that's appointed by the governor with the consent of the Senate. And then New York City, the criminal court and the family court are appointed by the mayor. All of those are elected. Um, and one of, the, one of the demerits of the electoral system uh, is the political process itself. If you go back to the founding of the nation, um, it, was, it was one of the tenets of the of the Federalists, and the Federalist Papers particularly, Madison writing about the way a judiciary ought to be constructed, was to keep it out of the political process, which is why the federal judiciary, in fact, is an appointed bench. And they serve lifetime uh, tenure as a way of insulating them from the bruising crush of politics. And there is a, a, uh, a, a strong sense among the advocates of the so-called merit selection system, <coughs> and subjecting judges to the bruising give and take of politics, um, analogizing judicial elections to legislative or executive elections, where in order to win, you have to make promises, and you have to, you have to raise money, and you have to pander to certain constituencies, uh, and you raise expectations of behavior in a certain way once you get to the bench, is fundamentally inimical to the role of a judge, which is to be impartial and independent. So if you are running for judicial office, then you um, want the vote of the uh, pro-choice or right-to-life advocates. How are you going to get without, without broadcasting what your position is? And can you say it in a way that doesn't prejudge how you're going to handle 
a case that might involve the abortion issue. And it won't even necessarily be a case that deals with abortion per se. It might be trespass at a clinic that advises women on abortion or that performs uh, abortion so that the actual issue before the judge was a trespass committed really doesn't have anything to do with the overall issue of, of abortion, but with the Right to Life Party having a line uh, in New York, um, with pro-choice and Right to Life activists um, engaging themselves in political races, and specifically in electoral cases, targeting judicial races, it's very difficult to reach office in a way that preserves the impartiality that you must exemplify once you get to the bench. That's the great argument. Uh, that and the, and, 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 the, uh, and the corrupting influence of money. It doesn't have to be on a particular issue. Uh, but there was a, a, a case that the U.S. Supreme Court recently decided, the Caperton case, Caperton against Massey, which involved $3 million in contribution by a corporation uh, or, by, or by, a, by independent expenditures on behalf of a particular candidate for election to the state's highest court. That candidate won and passed a deciding vote in a multi-million dollar case with far-reaching implications for the corporation that whose, whose chief executive had, had made those expenditures. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court, in its current 5-4 configuration, which has tended uh, to, to um, withdraw restrictions, campaign finance restrictions, even this seemed to have been uh, too much for uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. And the application of the rules that require independence and impartiality appeared to have been violated. Now, the judge could, on the merits, have come to the same conclusion if the firm hadn't contributed five cents to his candidacy. That's almost beside the point. To the public, there's no way, and to the losing side, there's no way to convince them that this was a fair decision that was uninfluenced by the massive amounts of money. Now, on the other hand, those who advocate the um, electoral system point out, particularly in New York, that historically, um, when appointment was the mechanism, it tended to be, and not just in New York, but in other states, a good old boy network. That the diversity of the bench hardly reflected the gender, racial, and ethnic diversity of the population from which the uh, judiciary was to be drawn. But those good old school ties, which tended to weigh more heavily um, to a time when there weren't as many women and minorities in law school and becoming lawyers as there are today, tended to produce a judiciary that didn't look anything like the population and certainly didn't look much like um, the litigating population that was coming into the into the courthouses. Yep. So uh, given if, they, if the root cause of this is judges being seduced by their own power, how is the media going to help judges straighten up and fly by? <laughs> well, first of all, um, by the way, did you notice how artfully I did not answer the question, which side do I come out? <laughs> <laughs> You have to really that, Well, I, that, that's exactly right. There's a reason for that. Um, and that's because we discipline judges regardless of how they got to the bench and regardless of whether they're lawyers or not. Um, and the commission and I and my predecessor, um, as the chief executive officer, made a conscious decision some years ago not to publicly broadcast our own views of how judges ought to be elected or selected. <coughs> or whether a part-time town and village court justice system should be reorganized uh, or scrapped altogether or limited to lawyers for fear of having our decisions interpreted through um, a, a cloudy lens. And it's not 
something that that we have we have ever uh, done. I mean, I do have to have views on the subject, but um, I try to keep those to myself. Um, what can the, what can the media do? Well, certainly in in situations like the Blackburn case, uh, with the assistance to the defendant escaping arrest, or the restraint of police, along with the cell phones. Um, the media is at its, it's at its quickest and its best at informing the public of something unusual and newsworthy that has happened. Now, with, with declining revenues and uh, the decline in the print journalism medium and the decline uh, in broadcast journalism, ABC is uh, you know the announcement that some 400 people in at ABC News are are being are being let go. There just aren't as many people covering the courts as there used to be. Um, and uh, my wife was a who, who was a newspaper reporter and for a number of years was covering the New York City criminal courthouses. Was was as many newspaper reporters uh, were were forced to do was covering numerous courts. And you just can't uh, be where all the action is all the time. If there were a way for the media to figure out a way to, um, to rejuvenate its finances and, the, and the, the news absorbing habits of the, of the population, there are great stories in the courthouses. Human interest stories, public interest stories, uh, the bizarre, the unusual, um, uh, the, the passionate, the profane, the, the emotional, the touching, there's all kinds of phenomenal newsworthy stuff going on in the courthouses that there just aren't enough people to cover and report. But when a, 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 a fast-breaking news event of such magnitude as a judge helping a defendant escape or a judge locking up 46 people because of a cell phone ringing, they jump on it as they should, and they've got to have their eyes and ears in the courtrooms. Um, we used to use stringers back in the old days uh, to to get at those stories. So that's the first. That's the first thing. Yes, there's more. Do you think that that's oh. why the situation in Pennsylvania went on for so many years without any good official attention? Do you think it seems like nobody was opening their eyes, or nobody was telling on anybody. It was the Pennsylvania judges and their well, in, it, it seems to me that in the same way that a judge can effectively put on blinders as a result of, of all of the deference that's paid to them over in the years, and they stop seeing objectively how they are behaving. Um, it happens in the courthouses with lawyers and, and, and the institutional players as well. Um, you're so used to things being done a certain way that you don't realize that there's something terribly wrong going on. The, the lawyers, the public defenders don't speak up. The, the, the victims in, in the juvenile cases are almost all from lower economic status, so they don't have private counsel to, to fight <coughs> whatever it costs. And it's an easy solution to send someone away for rehabilitation, whatever you call it. Um, and if you're a public defender and you've got 30 of these on a given day, and it's all you can do to spend 30 seconds with your client before uh, the judge is going to be sending him or her off, it's very, very difficult to even recognize that something goes on. And then you don't go to the juvenile facility to find out what life is like there for your client. You only see them when they're transported by the authorities to the courthouse for their next appearance. And everyone is protesting that they don't belong there. Um, even the guilty say the same things. And it's, it's very, very difficult at some point when you're overwhelmed with your caseload um, and there's no private advocate was being paid good money, lots of money sometimes, to keep that kid out of trouble, to find the alternatives, to make the motions, to 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 um, 
uh, to invoke habeas corpus to do whatever it takes, uh, the system is just too big and too crushing. And I think that's what I think has happened. We had a case in New York. Um, uh, in the city of Troy, the judge's name is Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, also on the website, also in the appeal, um, who was putting people in uh, jail at exorbitant bail for offenses that didn't even carry jail time if guilty. And it will shock you to hear, I hope it shocks you to hear, uh, that he was putting people in jail, setting bail $25,000. And obviously, these were people who couldn't afford $25,000. For four times he did this in a period that we looked over a year and a half, for riding a bicycle on the sidewalk, or riding a bicycle without um, a, a, a light or a warning device, a bell. So in the city of Troy, if you were riding a bike uh, on the sidewalk, and a, police officer decided to arrest you for whatever reasons. And none of these had additional credit. We're not talking about someone who, you know, was dealing drugs and tossed them out and was riding his bike and the bike was all they could get on. These were bicycle equipment violation cases, $25,000 in bail. None of these kids could make the bail. I say kids, some of them were in their own toys. They couldn't make the bail. They were not assigned counsel. They spent a week in jail. And when they came out, they were given the choice by the judge, plead guilty, and I'll sentence you to time served. Now, incarceration is not a legally recognized penalty for riding your bicycle without a light or a bell. Or, you go back in, until you get a lawyer. So every one of them, not surprisingly, pleaded guilty. And at the same time, probably effectively lost their claim to false arrest and false imprisonment uh, because they had pleaded, they had pleaded for the offense. That judge was removed from office for a gross abuse of, of discretion. There were quite a number of cases where this sort of thing um, was happening. Where was the public defender's office? Where were the police officers? Where were the spectators? Where were the lawyers waiting for their private, private clients to have their cases called who saw this kind of miscarriage of justice taking place? To this day, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know why there was silence. I don't know why they didn't make complaints, um, why no one stood up. Lawyers tend to shy away from making complaints against judges because they don't want to become those troublemakers. And no media attention. There was no media attention for these cases. Now, if the, if, if, if a newspaper, and, 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 and one could have, one could have, you didn't even have to make a complaint. You could have even told the newspaper reporter, you know, there's some odd things going on in Detroit City Court. You might want to go and watch a couple of days. There's a great story to do that. But who are the people who are being incarcerated? There are people without a voice. There are poor people who can't afford bail, who are riding their bikes, and are being and are being sent to jail for it. And there was no institutional actor stepping up to their defense. And I must tell you, when we first got the complaint about it, we didn't believe that it could be true. It just didn't seem possible that this could be true. But we examined and we came up with some 60-some-odd episodes of a gross abuse of, 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 the, of the discretion to set bail. Yes. How did this all come to light? We got a complaint from you finally one got of the defendants. Complaint. Not from a lawyer, not from a <coughs> concerned citizen, but from one of the defendants who wrote to us from jail. And immediately, your office acted on it. We looked at the complaint. We didn't. We thought it. It just didn't sound right. But it just didn't sound believable either. So we clarified it. We 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 we, we looked for the for the record of this particular defendant's incarceration and determined that it, that that the documents seemed to support uh, what he was saying. And then. Uh, we, we started examining other so cases. So there was a pattern. <laughs> there was a pattern, and there was some 60 some odd episodes that we were able to establish over a, over, over a year and a half. So, uh, but it took that 67th or 68th case to go back to the 60, the previous 66 case. That's cases. absolutely right. That's right. And no one had ever said anything to us about it. And although the judiciary tends to think of my office as being ubiquitous, um, 
and that's the kindest word I can think of. Uh, the fact is, we, we're not everywhere. We have four, I have 49 staff, it's a big state. There's 14 or 1,500 courts throughout the state. We rely on, on information coming to us from these courts, from people who have seen and experienced this behavior. So if, if I were the editor of a metropolitan area newspaper, I would make sure that I had reporters going into the courthouses just to watch what's going on and they might find, as my investigators sometimes find, that court staff, if you're going into family court, for example, the presumption in New York is all courts are public. All court settings, se sessions are public, with certain specific exemptions. Youthful offender status, a judge can close the court. Uh, a, uh, a confidential informant, the judge can close the court or put up a screen or somehow mask the identity. But the presumption is public proceeding we have investigators from my office who go to spectate because we have a complaint about someone's demeanor being consistently uh, out of line, and they are interrogated by court staff. Who are you? Why are you here? Are you here for a case? What are you doing here? Uh, the judge's rule is you can't sit here. And one of my investigators a couple of months ago was actually called up because she refused to leave, was called up to the bench, and the judge, on the record, started questioning her as to why she was there and who she was. And our rule is, uh, you don't lie. So she, she gave her name, told her what office she was from. Uh, the judge, I'm sure, regretted having made a public display of this spectators visiting there. On the other hand, the judge's behavior the rest of that day was exemplary. <laughs> she was there. Uh, and sending a reporter into a family court just to see if he or she can get in would be an instructive um, activity. But what should the media's role be? I mean, there are good stories to be had here, so follow the nose for news and, and go to where the stories are. But should the media's role be to change the way that judges reach office? Should you be going to visit the courtrooms of elected judges because you think all judges should be appointed? Should you, the way the New York Times did uh, in 2006, do a huge three-part series on the history and the activities of the town and village courts, highlighting some of the more bizarre uh, behavior that goes on in these courts, similar to some of the stories that I have um, mentioned today, taking place in the courthouses? Well, the New York Times can do it um, because They've got the resources, and they and they uh, and they literally devoted one reporter to this story, and he visited over 150 courts. Um, he must have interviewed several hundred people, but it took him about six or eight months. And one of the results was that the budget for my office was doubled because the legislature, in reading the story, held decided that they had to do something. About, about, about this problem of judges who don't know the law uh, but are nevertheless responsible for imposing it or executing it. And both the State Assembly and the State Senate held hearings on the nature and the future of the town village court system. And what they commonly concluded was, well, they couldn't agree on changing the system entrenched forces that wanted to leave it the way it was. There were some that wanted radical change, abolish those courts altogether, and there were some that wanted to impose a requirement that lawyers only could serve on those courts. Um, and what ended up happening was the Office of Court Administration increased its budget for training and education, and they equipped every one of these judges with a laptop that had audio recording capability because these are not courts of record. There's no requirement, even if they're handling a criminal case, that there be a stenographic record. So the court system decided that it would fund a mechanism to mandate the audio recording of everything that goes on in these courts. And the enforcement of the rules, which is what my office does, for the first time in a generation, was deemed to be an important legislative priority. So in 2007, 
my budget went from 2.8 million to 5 million. And I was able almost to double the staff um, with which we can deal with these things. An enormous benefit of, of, of media coverage. I think on the news of your doubled budget, we're going to have to conclude. We're happy, out of time. Happy ending. Happy ending. So I know there are other questions. No um, linger, and I'll take them. And uh, there's a reception in which you can pursue your questions and hear some answers. Please join me in thanking Mr. Robert. Schmitt.